Hello. In this third video in the set, I will look at the career and impact of the founder of American behaviorism, John Broadus Watson. Although Watson's thesis was not entirely original, it expressed and crystallized ideas which had been becoming increasingly widespread for over a decade. He presented these ideas in a way that was both audacious and forceful. And by the 1920s, behaviorism became the leading approach to psychology in the United States and remained the dominant paradigm there through to the 1950s, exerting a major impact on the overall development of the discipline worldwide. In its developed form, American behaviorism quite obviously borrowed from the ideas already developed by Thorndike and Pavlov, which I have briefly described in the previous two videos. In particular, it took from Thorndike his insights into associationist learning amongst animals, the chickens associating a particular color with the reward of sweet-tasting corn, for example, the cats associating a step on the treadle with escape and food, and the laws of conditioning developed by Pavlov. More generally, the success of behaviorism reflected, and perhaps channeled, the anti-mentalist perspective which had come to be espoused by a growing number of American psychologists and others from the 1890s onwards. For the anti-mentalists, it seemed obvious that ideas based on the proliferating number of animal studies could be applied to humans. And if animal behaviors could be explained without reference to mentalist concepts, then part or even all of human behavior could be too. Thus, all the intractable questions about mind could be ignored as unnecessary to understanding human behavior. If mind didn't exist, these questions would be meaningless. Watson provided the leadership and vision, but there were already many psychologists who accepted his basic assumptions. I should note that our textbook for this course, Morton Hunt's The Story of Psychology, is extremely negative both in its description of Watson and of his role as the founder of a new school of psychology, Hunt tagging Watson as, quote, Mr. Behaviorism and effectively dismissing him as a gifted huckster who had the charm of a traveling salesman who successfully peddled himself and his ideas to his colleagues. The image that emerges is of Watson's behaviorism as being something like a sales pitch. Hunt also characterizes Watson as emotionally frozen, a man unable to express his feelings, who seemed more at ease with rats than with humans, and whose rejection of introspection and self-evaluation in psychology mirrored his own emotional state. Born in 1878, Watson came from a rural South Carolina family. His father was a violent, petty farmer who abandoned the family when Watson was 13, an act which had a lasting impact on the young boy. His mother was a devout Baptist who found her son difficult. John was idle, insubordinate, and violent. At the same time, the boy was very gifted and could show an impressive capacity for hard work. Convincing the president of the local Baptist college to give him a chance to study, he excelled and showed a particular interest in psychology. He then appealed to the president of the University of Chicago to let him do graduate work. Arriving in Chicago with only $50 and no other financial support, he worked at various part-time jobs while successfully meeting the demands of graduate study. Watson's work at Chicago was again exemplary and in 1908 he accepted a faculty position at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore and was immediately promoted to the chair of psychology. He was only 30 years old. Watson had followed Thorndike's work with rats and mazes with particular interest and found it congenial. I never wanted to use human subjects, he reported. With animals I was at home. His early researches thus included teaching rats to navigate their way through complex mazes, including a miniature replica of the Hampton Court maze, and systematically disabling trained and untrained rats to see which senses they were using, for example, blinding some, surgically destroying the sense of smell in others, and so on, and finding that even sense-deprived rats were able to learn the maze, 
from which he concluded that kinesthetic cues, muscle sensations, were the key element in the rat's learning process. What brought him fame, however, was his formulation of a new psychology based entirely on observable behaviour. This was initially based on his own work and that of Thorndike and others, but he later incorporated Pavlov's concept of conditioning, enthusiastically endorsing the early English language accounts of the Russian's work. Watson voiced his views at meetings of psychologists in 1908 and 1912, and in 1913 published what came to be called the Behaviorist Manifesto in the Psychological Review, Psychology as a Behaviorist Views It. The basic principles of the Behaviorist Manifesto were revolutionary. First, that psychology, as the behaviorist viewed it, was a purely objective experimental branch of natural science. Secondly, that the theoretical goal of behaviorism was the prediction and control of behavior. Note the use of the word control. And thirdly, that introspection formed no essential part of the methods of psychology. All conjectures about invisible mental processes were rejected. The unseen processes of the mentalists, consciousness, memory, reasoning, will, and so on, could be ignored. For Watson, the real subject of psychology should be behavior, overt, visible, indisputable action. A properly scientific psychology would be based on laws derived from the observation of phenomena and not from conjectures and hypotheses about invisible functions. This was an audacious declaration of independence from all schools of psychology dealing with mental processes. The content of psychology was to be behavior, not consciousness. The method of psychology was to be objective. Uh, there was no introspection. And the purpose of psychology was to be the prediction and control of behavior, not a fundamental understanding of mental events. Watson charged that psychology had failed to become an undisputed natural science because it was concerned with conscious processes that were invisible, subjective, and incapable of precise definition. He jettisoned the entire philosophical tradition of speculating about psychology from the ancient Greeks onwards, but including modern thinkers like Wundt, James, and Freud. He regarded all of these thinkers as having been misguided, and proclaimed that the focus on intangibles was a hindrance to genuine understanding. Watson also dismissed all dualist discussions of mind and body. In his psychology, there was to be no reference to mental states or mind. Rather, psychologist's task was to study the connections between stimuli and responses. Simply put, rewarding stimuli were learnt, unrewarding ones were not. Moreover, as consciousness was not involved, the behavior of humans was the same as that of animals, and animal studies could be the basis for psychological understanding. Watson's pronouncement expressed and crystallized ideas which had become increasingly common, and soon came to influence the thinking of American psychologists. Already editor of the Psychological Review, Watson was an increasingly influential voice in American psychology, and he was seen as the youthful representative of a new generation of genuinely experimental rather than theoretical psychologists. His status was further enhanced in 1915, when, still only in his thirties, he was elected to the prestigious post of President of the American Psychological Association. Despite his audacious proposals for a new psychology, at this point he had still not outlined a specific methodology for his new behaviorist paradigm. He used his presidential address to the American Psychological Association in 1915 as an opportunity to address this lacunae. Appropriating for this purpose Pavlov's method of conditioning, even though he only knew the bare outlines of Pavlov's work. For Watson, Pavlov provided the model for all behaviorist experimentation, human as well as animal. Watson also began his own studies of conditioned reflexes in humans at about this time. Starting in 1916, but then interrupted by the war, they were only resumed in 1918, soon becoming some of the most famous experiments in psychology. Studying infants rather than adults, Watson first wanted to discover what stimuli would produce instinctive responses in babies and very young children, without any learning. 
He found that these innate responses were very few, mostly sucking, reaching, and grasping. A famous photo shows him holding a rod from which an infant is dangling by one hand like a monkey. He also identified three innate emotional responses. Fear at hearing a loud sound or at suddenly being dropped. The infant responded by catching its breath, puckering its lips, and then crying. Rage, when its arm or head movements were forcibly restrained. The infant responded by stiffening its body and making thrashing arm movements. It held its breath and turned red in the face. And love, when the baby was stroked, rocked, or gently patted. It responded by making gurgling and cooing noises or smiles. Having established his basics, Watson's main aim was to show that virtually all other human behaviours and emotional responses were built up of conditioned reflexes. I will continue this account in the next video, including the infamous Little Albert experiment.